Okay, that's good. Okay, so continuing on, um, Donna Davis is the uh, the uh, forester with the Department of Natural Resources Forest Service. Most of the counties have a, a county forester, and she works with landowners. And uh, she's going to talk about um, um, kind of this whole idea of, of transitioning land into natural area, what we call inter intermediate areas. All right, and I can answer your questions and. Um, I guess that's it. Okay. And I'm wired for takeoff. <laughs> it's not turned off. It's not turned off. The microphone's on. Leave it on, maybe I can find a battery. Okay. Do we have any nine volt batteries? <coughs> All right. Okay, so we're just uh, gonna touch on what you do with these intermediate use areas and those are the areas that are not your developed areas like your house and and your uh, swimming pool which I know everybody has an Olympic sized swimming pool in their backyard and uh, but it will be your your yard your mowed areas your pasture if you have pasture gardens orchards those would be your intermediate use areas I have, to, I have to direct it this way no. to get it to go? Or no, no, that's, that's a know. laser. Just this is for. Oh, this one. I'm technically challenged here. Okay, so this is what we're going to learn. Um, I, I think so. Yeah. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Peyton Manning's is a pansy. Can you <laughs> go Ravens. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants to go to watch the game today, do they? You all just gonna stay here. <laughs> okay, so this is what we're gonna learn today. We're um, gonna touch on a couple options of converting these intermediate use areas to natural lawn, to natural areas, and then um, talk about some tools and considerations. So just remember this this timeline here if we're starting with a you're starting you know with an empty field um, remember the the definition of natural succession okay so if you just let it go and it would start to revert to woodland uh, it might take about five years to start to start start to see some uh, woody material in there and if you're lucky, in 15 years or so, your trees and shrubs will get larger, that you're gonna get the canopy closure and on and on and on into the advanced growth and um, older growth forest. And as that progressed, you would have different management uh, techniques that you would um, do in there to meet whatever your objectives are. So when you're considering what do you want to do with these intermediate areas, these open areas that you're tired of mowing, um, remember to look around in the landscape, get on Google Earth, or um, there's also another program on the DNR website um, called Merlin, and it's a mapping program that you can use and you can get on it, and they've made it a little more user-friendly if anybody had seen it before, it was a real pain to use, but now it's a little more user-friendly. And you, so you can actually go in and you can actually put mapping lines around your property now. And you can do a little bit more than you, you can do this with the, um, the web soil survey, but with the Merlin, you can do a little bit more with that. But when you're deciding what you wanna do, remember, this, that's really a good thing, to look and see how your property fits in with the surrounding landscape and look for ways that you can build upon that to achieve your objective. So I'm going to try to use this pointer here so I can see it. This area right here, what's an opportunity that you see if you own this property where you could use the surrounding, someone else's surrounding property and build on that to improve wildlife habitat? Woodland. Woodland. woodland, yeah, this is excellent. You, you expand this woodland, expand this woodland all through here so you're not mowing this and then create uh, some soft edge around here 
up closer to the house. Uh, anybody have any ideas for this? This is kind of in a in a no man's land. Is that a house in the front? Yeah, that's a house right there. Mm -hmm. um, right across the middle. Is that a, a, like a creek? No, the other way. There. It yeah. might be right here. Yeah. Might, it could possibly be a drainage. So. What would we do there? Yeah. Find those areas. That's excellent to, to build upon. Is create a riparian forest buffers. These these areas where streams and water are are incredibly important for wildlife habitat. So you can ramp that up by planting trees and shrubs and creating not creating a wildlife corridor so that wildlife can safely reach that stream. And then the second thing you're going to do is protect water quality. Because when we plant trees and shrubs, shrubs around streams, we're protecting the water, we're keeping it cool, we're providing a source for infiltration from water runoff from adjacent properties. And, and I think you've already seen this right here. If you can, if you can employ neighbors to, to jump on board with what you're doing, get rid of these islands and maybe create fewer smaller areas in one big large area. Some of the wildlife people call these um, smorgasbords because <laughs> there are small little areas that are wonderful that, you know, your bunny rabbit runs in there and the fox can just walk around and around and around and around until the bunny rabbit comes out and grabs it. Um, and then consider what your objectives are. Do you, you know, do you want to um, if, do you want to maintain a view? So if you're going to plant something, or you plant lower, smaller trees, or keep it as a meadow. Um, I heard some people saying they're tired of mowing, and you know, mowing a steep slope is is a real pain. So stop mowing and let it grow up. And like we said before, look for opportunities to connect to wooded properties. Look for opportunities to work with your neighbors. This right here is just a perfect opportunity right here. If you had some, some like-minded neighbors and you could get them to come to one of these classes or show them your book and convince them of all the wonderful things that they can do if they're not mowing, um, you, you could get rid of this big hole in this forest and pull up this forest edge uh, much closer, pull wildlife in closer to your property, provide better corridors. So the two options we're going to cover are um, creating natural areas without tree cover and planting trees. Well, one way to create um, natural areas without tree cover is um, maintain your early succession, and that's just really let the grass grow. And there's a couple, there's a number of different uh, ways that you can do this. The house on the left, that's what your lawn may look like if you're going to only mow it every, you know, two to four years. The grass cover will be a little bit more advanced. If you have fescue, I can tell you fescue loves to be mowed, so the more you mow it, the thicker it gets. And fescue is pretty much a desert island. You know, it's not really good for any kind of wildlife habitat at all. So if you stop mowing it, it'll help it to thin out a little bit, and it'll give um, an opportunity for other maybe native grass seeds to seed in there. So you get a mix of grasses with some with seed heads on them. And that's what, when it becomes good wildlife habitat, good bird foraging areas. If you don't want it to stay that thick, you can just mow it once a year. And you'll have nesting sites for bunny rabbits and hunting areas for fox and things like that. But that's, that's still an option. Another, if you have a larger piece of property, the other thing you have to consider is how much acres you have. But, you know, if you've got several acres, three or four or five acres, you can even consider doing a, a delayed mowing technique where you're mowing, maybe uh, mowing strips every three years. You mow another strip and 
keep a continuous thing, uh, area of mowed strips and unmowed strips. And um, that type of mowing regime is great for uh, things like turkeys and quail uh, because they like to, they'll be in the tall grass hiding and foraging, but then the little pulps need to come out in the, um, in the lower grass. So there's, there's, different, there's different mowing options. It's not just one option. Another option, which is kind of neat, is um, to do a warm season grass or in a native wildflower meadow. And this is a more, this, we've gone from like least intensive management to a little bit more <coughs> intensive. This is going to be more intensive management. It's going to be a bigger um, economic outlay in the beginning. Uh, there may be cost sharing programs through wildlife departments and things to help you or even um, through like Ducks Unlimited or something sometimes to help you do this because it, it, it's going to involve burning off, killing, spraying, tilling off the cover you have there because it's all in grass and then seeding it back in with these warm season grass and wildlife seed mixtures. Usually they do it, you're, you're going to do it with a tractor and then there's a special seeder that, that um, actually NRCS does have one now the special seeder that can handle these small seeds, the warm season grass seeds are much smaller than you know your regular fescue seed. Um, cost a little bit of money, takes a little bit more um, management to keep these, and it takes <coughs> two to three years or so for these grasses to come up. So in that two to three years, you're probably gonna be out there doing some spot spraying, you know, if some thistle comes in or something like that. Here it says, you know, you usually need some big equipment. If you're, I know from experience, because we've done this on our property, if you're doing smaller areas and you're, you know, and you, and doing patches of, of like shrub and warm season grasses, shrub and warm season grasses, um, you can get out there with a tiller and do it yourself and then get out there with the hand seeder and seed it. Um, but it is, but the seed's a little expensive and you are going to have to do some maintenance because things will start to things will start to grow in there that you don't want. So you're going to be going out and spot spraying stuff like that with it. Um, cost share programs are available for that. Um, but one of the thing I did want to point out with with this, these mowing options, if you're going to let it grow up, especially if you're going to let it grow up for more than a year, a regular lawn tractor is probably not going to go through this. So, you know, if you've got your trusty Don Deere, and she has some really sharp blades and you've got it really hepped up, you, you may need to get something else, you know, something bigger, a bigger, you know, this, this is the opportunity, guys, push for that Kubota, you know, <laughs> maybe get a bigger tractor and, and get, you know, like, like you see on the or back. Or someone to do it. Or somebody to do it, yeah. If you got somebody local who will come in every two years and mow it that for, that it probably costs 40 to 60 bucks an acre, he could do it, but the Kubota's more fun, John. I mean, admittedly. <laughs> so you may need something like this where you have a bush hog on the back of it. If you've got an existing old field, another option is just to keep it there. If it's gone to this successional stage where there's a mix of, I'm sure there's fescue in here, this one on the left here, but there's also goldenrod, and there's probably a lot of warm season grasses in here. It's dotted with, with conifers. Um, that's fine, too. If that's a, this is wonderful wildlife habitat. This and the one, on the, the one here on the right is at a, a, a you know, less developed stage than the one on the left. And the easiest to maintain, because you don't really have to mow this at all. If you want to maintain it as, um, as the, the grasses without a lot of woody vegetation. You'll have to go in there periodically with your three gallon backpack or something or your chainsaw and do some hacking and squirting to cut down those woodies that are starting to come in. You're probably also gonna find that other things that are coming in are gonna be um, some invasives. So it'll take a little bit of maintenance, but that will be maybe I think every three years or so you may need to go in and check and see what's going on in there, and they do and these really do provide wonderful habitat if you get it to to this point where you have the one on the left where you have that mixture, because you've got um, you you can if 
if you're surrounded by farm fields, if you're not in an urban island, you, you might get quail in there, which we saw quail up at our property the other day, and it wasn't ours. So you could get quail in there and turkey and rabbits and um, all kinds of songbirds. There's all, there's all kinds of foraging opportunities in there with seeds as well as with bugs and things like that. Um, there's wonderful plants there for <coughs> pollinators. Goldenrod is a great fall, fall pollen source for honeybees. Uh, if you have any honeybee questions or pollinator questions, talk to Steve back there. He's, he's the bee guy. He knows. So, so that's it's great. It's messy, but it's a beautiful messy. Mm -hmm. And it's wonderful to watch the textures, the colors and textures change in these areas <coughs> as the seasons progress. And, and this is just showing you uh, your old field if allowed to progress and you have a seed source if you let it go may just progress into a uh, oops, to a young forest and that's the lowest cost at all you just leave it go but you're still going to have to go in there because we have an invasive we have lots of invasive plants in Maryland you're still going to have to go in there and um, control invasive species as they come in it's easier to nip them in the bud than to let them go and then you know and then you have a big problem and you've got more work to do so it's always good to go in and inspect every year or so and see if there's something coming in you don't want um, so when you decide well what type of succession where do you what type of uh, intermediate use do you want one of the ways to help you decide is maybe what type of um, if you're interested in wildlife well, what type of wildlife do you want to attract and the different stages of natural succession are going to attract different types of wildlife. Deer will be everywhere, so you can just, you know you're going to have deer. <laughs> and this slide is just reminding you that depending on where you, where you live, it's going to, when your successional stages come in and, and your different plants start seeding in, Depending on where you live, it is it's going to um, dictate a lot of what comes in there. You know, in Garrett County, you might get a lot of uh, uh, black cherry coming in. Where if we lived closer on the shore, you get things like sweet gum. Here in the Piedmont area, Baltimore, Carroll, Carroll County, um, you're going to get a lot of the things that you know in, in initially that Jonathan talked about earlier. We were talking about the red cedar and uh, things like that to come in. So, so we're going to talk a little bit about establishing trees now, and um, there's two ways you're going to do that, either through natural succession, um, and natural regeneration, or by planting trees. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about tree planting. One of the things you, the reasons why you would plant trees instead of just letting them seed in naturally is. Um, if you let them seed in naturally, what, what are you depending on? What's going to happen? You don't know. You know. What's going to come in is what the seed source is in the area. So if the seed source is what you want, you know, that's good. If you've got poplar and your soils are conducive to poplar and, you've, you've got, and what's going to come in is what you want, and you don't really care where the trees, are, where the trees wind up, then, and, you, and you're willing to wait then natural gene regeneration is the quickest way. But if you, if you want to ensure regeneration and you want to manipulate the species or you have specific um, objectives like you, you want to put in a visual buffer or you, you want to buffer a stream or put in a windbreak, then tree planting is the way to go. Um, there's a lot of different things you can do with the tree planting. You put in hedgerows and say you, if you want to put in a hedgerow, hedgerows are really cool because hedgerows are good for privacy. If you want, you can orient a hedgerow to make it a, a wind buffer. And also it's a wonderful wildlife corridor. So if you put in a hedgerow that's you know at least 50 feet wide or something and place it in between an area like maybe in between 
uh, if, if it leads from one a field area to somebody's pond or something, it becomes a wonderful wildlife protection area for that wildlife to move through your property so you get to view the wildlife and get safely from you know, the farmer's field to uh, you know, the pond or the stream on the other side of your property. Wind breaks, that's another reason why you may want to just plant the trees so you can get, you get the, um, the wind break oriented the way you want it that's um, going to provide you the wind resistance you need. Um, with, with wind breaks, you need to use all evergreens and three or four rows is good. Try to stagger the trees because you'll get quicker closure. Planting for water quality, this is a really great thing. Um, so that, as we mentioned before, uh, the best way to help improve and ensure water quality for us, and we've talked a lot about Chesapeake Bay, is to plant trees and shrubs along streams and waterways to help buffer that. It's also a great way to keep the water cool, so it improves fisheries habitat. 35 feet wide is really, you know, the minimum, but if you don't have that much, if you can only put a 10 foot buffer in or one row of shrubs, do it. It's better than nothing. It, it'll help stabilize the so tree, the soil along the banks, <laughs> and it'll help intercept anything, any, any water flow or fertilizers or anything coming off of the adjacent land source. So how do we get these trees in the ground if we're going to uh, plant them? Um, you, can, you can plant larger trees and you, know, you can plant something in a three gallon or a 10 gallon bucket. These would be called containerized. You can plant um, deep rooted species and something like that. This is going to cost you a little bit more money, but if you have a small section you're doing, you know, it might be worth it to you. <coughs> We're going to focus a little bit more on seedlings. And these are the things that you can get through the state nursery. The um, seedlings through the uh, state nursery. There's a flyer in your folder that gives you information on how to contact them if you'd like to get seedlings through the state nursery. You have to order a minimum of 100 though, but you can order them in lots of 25. So, I guess not. Okay. Um, so this picture of somebody planting trees. Uh, if you're gonna if you're gonna do an acre or more of trees, most of this that's called a reforestation project. And most of these projects, um, you want you're gonna plant probably want to plant 300 to 400 seedlings per acre if you're using the smaller stock. If you've got it in your budget to use the bigger stuff, you you know you might you can go down to maybe 200 per acre. Because the, the premise is, is that all these seedlings are maybe not going to survive. And um, so some will die out over, and that's why you plant them in such a, a, a close spacing. The, the key is to select the proper tree for the site. And we talked about soils, assessing what type of soils you have. So if you've got uh, moist soils that don't drain too well, you want to pick species that uh, do well in that kind of environment, pin oaks and things like that. If you've got a drier upland slope, you want to choose soils, uh, seedlings and uh, species that'll, that'll accommodate that. Um, and if you're doing seedlings, especially if you're doing these little bare root seedlings, <laughs> bare root means that they come to you looking like that. They're bare naked. There's no, there's no dirt around them. One of the key is, is to keep them fresh. You're, they're gonna come to you, if you get them from the state nursery, they'll come to you in a white bag. They usually dip them in a slurry, so they look, it's a clay slurry, so they look kind of white. And that's to try to hold in some of the moisture, but keep them cool and in a, dark, a cool, dark place. Spritz the bag with water if you, if you can't plant them right away. But don't put them in a bucket of water and have them sit there for two days. They'll drown. You can put them in a bucket of water if you're planting them right away, you know, the day you're planting them. But you, you can't have them sit there for a long period of time because they will, they'll drown. They'll, they'll drown. They need that air circulation. 
and they do dry out quickly. So the key to these, the doing bare root seedlings, is get them in the ground and get them in early. Try to get them in March to mid-April at the latest, and that'll help up your survival. Another thing that will help your survival is site preparation. Site preparation is very, very important. A little bit of time now saves you a lot of headache later. So especially if you're doing larger, you know, if you're doing a half acre or acre more or whatever, get that area the way you want it first and then put your trees in, which would mean if you, if you have a field area and you have some problem plants like um, thistle, which it is, there is a state law that um, you need to control thistle, which means keep it to going to seed. Um, or if you've got vines in this area you want to plant, anything that's going to wrap around your trees and cause you a lot of trouble. If you have fescue and grasses that are going to compete, grass is highly competitive to bare root trees. Get it done first before you put the trees in, even if you delay for a year. It really pays off in the long run. So if, so if you're going to, if you think you're going to plant next spring, this summer, start looking at your property, start controlling plants that you don't want in there, then mow it this fall. You can uh, kill the vegetation by strip spraying it two to three foot wide strip, which is where you're going to put your trees in. and. Um, and then uh, plant next spring. Now, how are you going to get these planted? There's a number of planting. You can use indentured servants like your kids or some volunteer uh, school groups. <laughs> um, you can hire, you can do them yourself, of course, or if you have a larger area, you hire, hire, hire uh, uh, tree planters, hire professional tree planters. You can have them hand planted or machine planted. Larger properties, if you're doing, you know, several acres and, and it's, it, it's conducive to machine planting, having them machine planted um, can be a little bit cheaper if you're hiring somebody and it's quick. If you've got a 50 horsepower tractor with a three-point hitch, you could rent, you can rent this planter from us, from DNR. And you know we'll show you how to use it. And you can plant the trees yourself. Um, you can use one of these things, which you can actually borrow from the Carroll County Forestry Board. This this tree planter, if you're going to hand plant them, and it's a, a very heavy tool, and you jam it into the ground, and rock it back and forth, and pop the tree in. I have some handouts that I want to give you all, I'll give to you at lunch, and it has a schematic of how to plant seedlings and how to plant um, your um, containerized trees. So and it, it explains how to use this tree planting bar. But this is about the size of your seedlings. So this works really well for small things and it's fast. And and you can you know, you, you can get these from the forestry board to use if you decide you want to do your, your own trees. Yes? If you buy a, a all the murloc tree mm -hmm. from a nursery and it comes with the wire cage and the burlap, mm -hmm. should you, and, and I've gotten different answers on this, Take the cage off and the burlap off and spread the roots. Or the warranty says, do not remove the cage and the burlap. You know, how do you feel about that? Well, if the warranty says do not remove it and they're going to replace the tree in, you know, 10 years when, you know, if it dies, then leave it on. But the idea is, is you're... With, with ball and burlap, you shouldn't have to spread the roots because theoretically the thing has just been dug not too long ago, so probably 90% of the roots are not there anymore because when they dig them, you lose a lot of the roots. So the idea is not to, to try not to disturb the roots. So if, if it's in soil that's very, very loose, 
it's hard to get that cage off without falling apart. I prefer to I prefer to take the cage off because I have pulled trees out of the ground before. They've been in the ground for 10 years and died, and I've pulled them up, and the cage is still on there, and it's strangled around the cage. But then there's other people that say leave them on. So you can, what you can do, if they say leave them on and you can't get that cage off because if you take it off, the root ball will fall apart, which isn't a good thing. Well, why isn't um, that a good thing? Because then it would be leaving your tree bare roots, basically, which is how you get them anyway. Well, for these larger trees, when they dig them bald and burlap, they, they, you're losing a lot of the roots, but there's a lot of little feeder roots in that mm -hmm. ball. And so if, when, if, if all the soil falls off and you disturb it, then you're kind of pulling off of the, all those feeder roots also. So what you can do is um, sort of a hybrid method. When you put that in the ground, you, you snip. Instead of taking it all out, you pull the cage back and down, and then the wire that wraps around it, you can snip some of that wire. The only time you leave the burlap on is if the burlap is real burlap. A lot of times it's burlap, synthetic burlap. That does that comes off. You do not leave that on. If it's a real cloth burlap, that'll rot. So if you're going to leave that on, you just make sure that it's underneath the ground and not sticking up because then it acts as a wick and you know and wicks all the moisture out of the ground. Okay, I only got ten minutes. Okay. Every time I left the wire on, because the warranty said so, the tree died six months after the warranty expired. <laughs> of course, yeah, of course. <laughs> okay, then after you get these trees in the ground, um, you need to protect them. And I think we did have a, there was a little bit of a discussion on these tree shelters. But if you're in, if I think most most of us are probably living in an area where there, you have deer problem. And these new trees are like candy. Oh, it's something new. Let's see what it is. <laughs> and they eat it. You, you, fertilize, you fertilize them to make it taste good. But anything new, I don't know if you've noticed, anything new you put out in your yard, there's, there's little wild goats just a beeline for it because they want to see what it is. Um, so you got to protect them, and you can do that in a lot of different ways. If you have a larger tree planting, you know, put up deer fencing. If you're doing smaller stuff, um, install tree shelters. Make your own cage, you know, to keep the deer off. I brought a couple um, samples of tree shelters just so that you know what they are. And there's a lot. There's a bunch of different. There's a bunch of different. Um, bunch of different brands of tree shelters. Everybody has their own favorite. I, I like Tubex. Some people hate Tubex, but everybody has their favorite. But they, they all perform approximately the same function. The directions I gave you are directions for putting Tubex on. In the, is that the, they go in the ground with the Tubex. You want to sink it in the ground an inch or two to try to keep the voles and the mice off of the trees. Um, there's a stake that goes in on the outside of it and this straps to the stake. And what the function of it is, is to protect it from deer, uh, to try to protect it from mice and rabbits, and if you're using herbicides to control competition around your little trees, because remember, grass is death to seedlings, it protects it from your, from your herbicide spray. So you can easily go around with your Roundup. And, and so it facilitates your maintenance. So that's what they're really good for. They come with these little these little nets that go on the top of them, and that's supposed to keep the birds from going in. And then you have a horror show when you look in, and you have dead bluebirds down in there. So that's what that is for. They do make, I don't recommend these solid shelters for conifers, pine, spruces, but they do make different types of Netting shelters are a little bit more of a pain to put on, but um, these tend to fry, you know, your spruces and your conifers if you're putting them in a sunny, dry area. These are a little bit more open. So there's a lot of different, um, a lot of different options for tree protection, but it is really important. 
It's also important to maintain the shelters if you're going to use these. Once you put them on, you need to periodically peer in there and make sure there isn't any grass or vines or things growing up inside as you may have to lift it up and pull that out. Sometimes they do become little mice hotels. If they can get up underneath of them or chew a hole into them, then you have a nice little mouse house. And of course, mice like to chew on things, so of course they chew on your seedling because it's just there. Um, so that will happen. That's a case for doing your mowing and your maintenance because that, that mowing and the maintenance will keep your, uh, your mouse and bowl habitat down. Can I ask a question? Yes. Is there one that's preferable for fruit trees? Um, no, not really. Um, I've, I've seen them use all of them. I've seen them use these. They just cut them down shorter because they don't want the fruit trees. Most people don't want their fruit trees um, branching up quite this high, you know, and that skinny. So we use these. We have some fruit trees and we use these. We just cut them shorter. So. Um, and don't leave them on too long. Theoretically, they're supposed to like split and then fall to pieces, but a lot of times they don't. So you need to, you may need to go out and take them off before this happens. About wherever it was. Forward. The one on the left there. It, the tree grew into the shelter and then it, that's not that's not good for the tree. Maintenance maintenance is pretty important, especially the first three to five years when your trees are small. Um, mowing herbicide application to reduce competition, mowing to reduce um, habitat for mice, voles, rabbits, things that will chew on your trees. There it is again, planting seedlings in turf without killing the vegetation within three feet is a recipe for a disaster. The turf will suck all the, new, all the water out of the soil before the seedling gets it because the grass roots are shallower than the seedling roots. And also, if you let it grow, then it becomes that habitat area where the voles and the mice can hide and they'll chew on your trees. If you don't see any above ground damage, they may be below ground eating your roots. And here's some mice and vole damage. This is, this is a vole, a pine mouse, pine vole at the top, meadow vole at the bottom. And they, they, they not only eat around the outside, but they'll go underneath and burrow underneath and they'll eat the roots. So I've seen it where you have a tree that's two inches in diameter and it leafed out and looked beautiful and it went up and pulled on it and it popped right out of the ground and all the roots were eaten up. They, they'll, they eat them in the winter time when they don't have any succulent uh, vegetation <laughs> to eat like grasses and you know young leaves and things. So they go underground and they eat the roots and then your tree leaves out and then it dies and you don't know why and you pull it out and there's no roots because they were eaten in the winter. So um, there is a, there's a, um, a bowl management uh, document on Jonathan's website or on your resources website that talks about this and, and how, to, how to put out a trap, a bait trap to see um, how many, if you have a bowl problem, and then how to deal with that before you, you know, start your, putting your trees in, your plantation in. And some of your, using herbicides and weeding is very important too. And if, if you don't want to use herbicides, see, that's your option, but, you, you know, you're just, be prepared for a, a lot more intensive maintenance. To control the to control competing vegetation, this is really important. And these are just pictures of what like a strip herbicide or a circle would look like around each tree. Um, vine removal, invasive species control. We talked about that, uh, or 
you, you know, if, if you started off with good site preparation and then continuous, uh, continuous maintenance, your stand could look like this on the right. If you let it go to so long, too long, you could be, you could be pl plunged into hell like the stand on the left. And I don't know what you would do. You know, there's probably trees under there, you know, <laughs> but you can't see it. So. Um, and as Jonathan says, be familiar with some of your invasive species. Get familiar with them so that you know what you're looking at and what you should be getting rid of before it becomes a problem. And this might be, hopefully, in five, seven years, this is your reward. You, you see nice big trees and you approach canopy closure and you let it go. There's a little note down here that you, we did touch on is to be aware of your local ordinances, right-of-way ordinances, and, you know, weed control ordinances. Um, at lunch, i got to get going, but um, there's, there's a contraption right here that the Carroll County Weed Warriors uses, and you're welcome to come up and take a look at it. It's called a weed wrench, and if you have large bushes, like honeysuckle bushes or something, that you want to pull out of the ground, you don't want to spray them, this is really a cool tool. It, it can yank that kind of stuff right out of the ground, so you're welcome to come look at it. And if you have any questions about mechanical invasive species removal, you can talk to Connie or um, or Carolyn. And in your, um, these are just sources of assistance here. In your packet, there is also a flyer about this program, the Backyard Buffers Program. So I invite you to to read that and if you think you qualify to get in touch with the forestry board um, because it, it's you'll get a packet of 25 free seedlings that you can plant this spring they'll be available I think April 6th is when they're distributing that so take a look at that at that program there's also other cost sharing programs that you might be able to qualify for through the Maryland Forest Service office or NRCS for larger plantings. If you have at least five acres of woods now and you want to plant an acre or more or you want to plant to make five acres of woods, you can get cost sharing for the Woodland Incentive Program to do that. So you can, you know, talk to us at lunch or give us a call, give you know, call our office later on and, um, if you have any other questions. So, and Great. I think that's it. Good job. This is my time. Yeah. <laughs> so now it's the best part of the day. Lunch. So uh